Tonight is the parable of the little life-saving station. A parable has been described by many as a earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And I think you will understand as we begin to reveal this parable about the little life-saving station and what it is really referring to when we talk about it. It begins by saying on a dangerous sea coast where shipwrecks often occur, there was once a crude little life-saving station. The building was just a hut. There was only one boat. Just a meager little building is where it had its start. That brings to my mind about our own congregation here at Nettleton. Where that many years ago, some say somewhere around 1921, 1922, the church here at Nettleton first started meeting in a little one-room building behind Main Street, actually located right behind George's Jewelry today. There was a little one-room building there. And they, many of the brethren began to meet there. It was there, even though they had met before that time, it was at that time that they began to refer to themselves as the Church of Christ. After that time, meeting in that little, small, one-room building, they had several other moves. They moved to, later on, Clark Street, and began to meeting in a house there. And then later, they built a building facing Thorn, Thorn Street and met there for a good time. That's where I first started attending. It was there in at, on the building on Thorn Street. And it wasn't long until they outgrew that building and they bought some property along Howland Drive, where we're located at now. And they built the first building what we call the small auditorium now, was the first building they constructed. Things went well. That was about 1961, 1962. It wasn't long till we outgrew that building. So by the beginning of the 1970s, the decision was made to build a larger auditorium in front of the old building that was there. That's where we're seated at tonight, in that building. But to think that it had its beginning in such a small way. Much like the little life-saving station that we're going to talk about tonight. It was just a small building. They only had one boat. But what made the difference? They had a few devoted members. And they kept a constant watch over the sea. And when no thought, with no, without any thought about themselves, they went out day and night, tirelessly searching for the lost. They never thought about what their purpose was. They knew what it was. Their purpose was to rescue the lost, or those that would be lost, from shipwrecks, from the cold, Atlantic waters and bring them safely to shore. That was their primary duty and they never forgot that. So they did that both day and night. Some of those who were saved and various others in surrounding areas wanted to become associated with the station. They were so impressed by what they did they wanted to be a part of that. And they gave their time and they gave their money and they gave their effort to support the work of the Little Life Saving Station. New boats were bought and new crews were trained and the Little Life Saving Station grew and grew. It wasn't long till some of the members of the Life Saving Station were unhappy. That happens sometimes. They weren't happy that the building was so crude and it was so poorly equipped. So you can imagine 
where it went from there. They felt that a more comfortable place should be provided. As for the first refugees of those saved from the sea, so they replaced the emergency cots with beds, and they put better furniture, and they enlarged the building. Now the life-saving station became a popular gathering place for its members. And they decorated it beautifully because they used it for, well, sort of a club. Fewer members were now interested in going to sea on life-saving missions, so they hired professional lifeboat crews to do that work for them. The life-saving motif still prevailed in the club's decorations, and there was still liturgical lifeboats in the room where the club initiations were held. About this time, a large ship wrecked off the coast, and they hired crews, and they brought boatloads of cold, wet, and half-drowned people in. They were dirty, and they were sick, and the beautiful new club was in chaos. So a property committee immediately had a shower house built outside the club. After all, they didn't want those cold and wet people in their beautiful building. It says where buildings of the shipwreck could be cleaned before coming inside. The next, at the next meeting, guess what happened? At the next meeting, there was a split among the club membership. Most of the members wanted to stop the club's life-saving activities as being unpleasant and a hindrance to normal social life of the club. Some members even insisted upon life-saving as their primary, some members still insisted upon life-saving as their primary purpose. Remember, after all, at the beginning, that was their primary purpose, life-saving. And pointed out that they were still called a life-saving station. But they finally voted down and that, that ideal and told that if they wanted to save the lives of various kinds of people who were shipwrecked in those waters, they could just go begin their own life-saving station. So what do you think happened? They did. <laughs> they went and built their own life-saving station. As years went by, the new stations experienced the same changes that had occurred in the old. It evolved into a club, and yet another life-saving station was founded. History continued to repeat itself time after time. And if you visit that seacoast today, you'll find a number of exclusive clubs along the shore. Shipwrecks are still frequent. They haven't stopped in those waters. But what happens? But most of the people today who are shipwrecked off the coast, they just drown because there's no one there to save them. Kind of sad, isn't it? When you look at that picture and you see all those hands reaching up for someone to save them, there's no one there. They've got all these big, beautiful buildings, but they no longer serve the purpose that they were intended to serve, the purpose of saving lives they had forgotten. That's the parable of the little life-saving station. Remember, a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning, is it not? So the question is, 
Are we failing in our missions? What is the mission of the church? It was just read to us before the lesson began tonight. It's what Jesus our Savior said shortly before he left this earth in Matthew 28 when he told his disciples to go and teach all nations, to teach them all the things that he had taught them, baptizing them. He said that in doing that, he would be with them always, always to the end of the age, the end of the world. That was our mission as a church, to teach the lost. Someone said one time, said, our mission is to seek and save the lost. Well, actually that was Jesus' mission. Mission. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. Jesus is the only one that can do the saving. What Jesus wants us to do is to do the teaching. That's where the problem is sometimes. We get discouraged and we say, we don't have very many people. You know, it seems that nowadays we base church growth on how many people you can pack into a building. Oh, they're full, they're growing. That's not necessarily true church growth. True church growth is what happens within the individual. Their spiritual growth, their spiritual maturity, their dedication, their outlook about spiritual things. But yet, we think that's true growth. And we forget that it's really our job, it's our duty as Christians to teach. That's what Jesus said in the beginning, that we were to go and to teach all nations. No, not everybody's going to respond to it. People get discouraged. Well, no. You know, we're not baptizing very many people. Well, we keep teaching. Well, there's not very many people listening. We keep teaching. There's not very many people coming to service. Well, we keep teaching. And we don't stop teaching. And it's portrayed in the parable of the sower. I firmly believe if we plant the good seed that there will be those that respond. There will be a great harvest. There will be those that will be and obey the gospel. That's the mission of the church. It was the mission of the church during the first century. It's the mission of the church today to go and to teach to make disciples, make disciples of Jesus Christ. Matthew 28, 19 through, uh, 28, 19 through 20. It's our mission to preach the gospel of Christ. Mark 16, 15 and 16. Go ye into all the world, teach the gospel, or preach the gospel to every creature, he that believeth. And as baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. It says, it says the Apostle Paul told Timothy. He told Timothy, he said, Timothy, you preach the word. You be instant in season and out of season. In other words, you remain dedicated. You don't just do it when it's convenient or when you feel like it or when the mood hits you. You be consistent at doing this, Timothy. Be instant in season and out of season. Rebuke, reprove, and exhort. And that's, that's part of what our teaching is. It's not only to teach those that are lost and what they need to do in order to be saved, but to encourage one another too and remind each other what our duty is and why we, why, why we need to stay faithful in all things and not give up. That is what we're to do in preaching the gospel of Christ. To proclaim the praises of God, that's part of our mission. 
to tell the others what the great what great blessings we have in Christ. And what great things are awaiting those who obey the gospel. Their sins are forgiven. Considering those that we have example of in Acts chapter 2. When they ask what they must do to be saved. Acts 2 and verse 37. And then they were told to repent. To be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. For the remission of your sins. Their sins would be forgiven. They also in Acts chapter 2, we find that those that did obey the gospel on that great day, in Acts chapter 2 and verse 47, that Jesus added them to his church, to his kingdom. When you obey the gospel, your sins are forgiven. You're added to the kingdom of Christ. You're a citizen of the kingdom of Christ now. We also find where they met and they fellowship regularly. There's many, many blessings to be had in being a member of the Lord's church. And in all that, we are to proclaim the praises of God. We come together to sing praises of God, to praise God for all that He has done for us. So, how can we fail in our mission? Well, I think we all know the, the answer to that. There's many ways we can fail. By failing to do what we're supposed to be doing. We can become like the little life-saving station. We can be attracted by other things. And we can forget what our primary purpose is. Just like they forgot what their primary purpose was. And what happened? Those that were shipwrecked, they just drowned because there was no one there to save them. Lest we forget, we need to be reminded regularly what our purpose is and how we can fulfill that mission, which is to teach. We can do it through misplaced emphasis, just like those did in the little life-saving station. We can put our emphasis on other things. In Revelation, Jesus reminded they were reminding, he was reminding one of the seven churches of Asia that they had left their first love. He said, you need to come back. You, you put your emphasis on the wrong thing. You need to repent and come back. So we can do it by misplacing our emphasis. We can do it through showing preference. In Acts chapter 10, verses 34 and 35, that happened that happened, in fact, to some of the apostles. They were showing preferential treatment to some of the brethren. And the apostle Paul made that correction. He made sure they, they knew that what they were doing was not right. There is no preference. We're all one in Jesus Christ. And James, what about James? He talks about people who treat people differently because of the way they look, what they wear, maybe how they talk. We're not to do that. We're not to show preference. What happened with the little life-saving station? Did they do that? Yes, they did. When they began to have this beautiful building to meet in, they didn't want those wet, dirty, sick people in their beautiful building. They were showing preference. We can also do it through worldly preoccupation. Letting the world claim all of our attention. And that's awful easy to do. And we have to constantly, constantly guard against that. Lest that takes preference of our life. Remember in Luke chapter 8 and verse 14. You know, those are the seeds that fell among the thorns. In the parable of the sower. And what did Jesus say about those that fell in, those seeds that fell among the thorns? He said they sprang up quick. But the cares of the world choked them out. The thorns choked them out. 
I know I've seen that. You've seen that happen. We have some that obey the gospel and oh, they're just on fire. They just, they, how, what can I do? I want to do so much. And, and they're just so eager to do things to, for, for the sake and the cause of the gospel. Going really good. But then trials and temptations come along. Some things of the world claims their attention. And pretty soon you look around and they're gone. They're gone. They've let the thorns choke them out. And then also, we need to be reminded that souls are lost without Christ. Sometimes we seem to forget that. That souls are really lost without Christ. So we need to seek, we need to save the lost. We need to teach them and go after them. We're reminded of Luke 19.10, For the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which is lost. That's what Jesus did. Now on a positive note, before we leave. Yes, we may be few, but I have to add that in a lot of ways we're reaching out in ways that we were never able to reach out before. And I'm referring to our TV program. And I see and I hear and I, I can tell you firsthand that there are people being reached. And you might say, well, where are they? Well, maybe they're not here. But there are people that are being reached. And not just in our own local area. What's so amazing about it is the, through GBN and them carrying our broadcast, there's people that's being reached throughout the United States and even some of our territories and even in Europe. Why do you know that? Well, last year I talked to a lady who called and one day and she was from Germany. Yes, yeah, she was on an Air Force base there in Germany. But she called and said they had been watching our TV program regularly. And many people were interested in it. And she wanted to ask if we could send her some material. She requested some books and other things. If we could send that to her so that she could teach others on that base. And even in the community there in Germany where they live. So we did. We sent that material to them. That's only one thing among many that could be mentioned. And then also, let's not forget about social media. Yes, social media can be bad, but social media can be good too when it's used for the right purpose. Some of you tonight are listening to this sermon through social media, perhaps on Facebook or perhaps on YouTube. Both of those places you can generally find us. and You can hear these lessons. So we're blessed with having those things. And oh yes, 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 we get great responses. And every week, James can tell you about many of those responses that we get from people who hear our lessons locally and those around the communities around about us. It's a great thing for those that are confined to their homes and otherwise wouldn't be able to hear. But through that, they can hear. We're blessed with that, that we can reach people in that way. We're to seek and save the lost. We're to, as Jesus said, we're to teach the people. And that's teaching. Let's never forget that. Also, for those that are listening tonight, if you're not a member of the kingdom of Christ, you can do just what those folks did in Acts chapter 2, as I mentioned a while ago, where they were asked what they needed to do. And they were told that they were to repent and to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of their sins. And then Christ added them to the church. Consider the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8. He was convinced he needed to be baptized. And he said, see... Here is water. What does hinder me from being baptized? Philip told him, he said, 
Well, if you believe, you may. And he said, oh, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. That's that good confession we all must make before we're buried in the watery grave of baptism and raised to walk a new life as he was. And he went on his way rejoicing. You can do that very thing today. Through faith, repentance, confession, and baptism, you can be added to the Lord's church and have your sins forgiven and start a new life. And for those that have been lax and forgot their first love, you can rededicate yourself and you can come back and you have that opportunity to do that. If you need us to pray with you tonight, we will. You have opportunity if you need to. Uh, you have opportunity now, so if you need to come, do that as we stand and sing the invitation song. So we have